So again, everyone, welcome to Student Presentations Online, Tips and Strategies. I do have a lot of information and activities prepared for you, so I think we can just go ahead and get started. The agenda that we have planned today is we'll just do a quick round of introductions and icebreakers. And then we can go ahead and we can explore some of the benefits of student presentations online. They are a little bit different than face-to-face, -face, um, so there are some unique aspects to consider. The part that I think most of you are most eager to look at are some helpful technology tools. How can we kind of change things up and increase the, uh, the dynamics of our classrooms online? I also have some strategies for instructors and then some best practices that you can share with your students. And walking down from all that, I have um, a new workshop coming soon to give you a quick preview of. And then our final wrap up is the formal Q&A. But if you have any questions along the way, uh, please feel free to chime in. You can raise your hand, come on the microphone, or just type in the text chat. So we'll be monitoring that as well. All right, so now that you know me, I would like to hear a little bit more from you. So if you would not mind, um, please feel free to go ahead and type this in the text chat, but let me know what is it that you teach? What discipline are you from? I'd also like to know uh, what excites you about online presentations. Um, and if this is something you've done in the past, what were some challenges that you encountered or maybe uh, some concerns that you potentially foresee? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes and um, we'll take a look at that in just a minute. You guys are quick typers. Okay. So we have Susan from the College of Health and Human Sciences. Um, one challenge that Susan encounters in some formats is that students' files are too big. Ah, so you're often stuck with Flipgrid, etc. Interesting. Okay, I've got some ideas for that. Chris is from Public Administration. And he wants to know how to make it easier for and to improve the student experience. So, okay, great. I love this. Very student-centered. How can we make this, you know, a project that seems like something that they can handle? Wonderful. Jennifer is from Public Health. And a primary concern with student online presentations is that students can be adequately engaged with each other. Oh, good. All right. I'm excited about all of these topics. Um, Marsha says that students have presented online before, some successfully, but most were not fully prepared to load up videos. Ooh, okay, I have quite a few ideas for you on this. Um, let's see, is it Yunjo? I'm sorry, I, I'm sure I, I may have mispronounced your name. I do apologize. Um, you're an associate professor in the Department of Public Administration. And let's see, you like the flexibility of online presentations and student participations in the discussion. Yes, absolutely. There's so many different ways that students can upload their presentations um, and that really does kind of impact the, the participation with the rest of the class. Wonderful. And Mary teaches in the School of Nursing and challenges that she faces are technology issues, the flexibility and student satisfaction since we have students across multiple states. Wonderful, okay. So I think we've got a lot of different challenges here, um, things that people are looking for. Uh, 
All right. Well, I think we'll be able to address most of these things. And um, if not, if you have some specific questions, I'm always open to trying to answer anything that you can throw at me, so. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the benefits of online presentations. I think that these are substantially different maybe than face-to-face -face presentations. And so depending on how you set this up as an instructor, there are some things um, that can really benefit your students that maybe you haven't even considered. Um, to start with, I'd actually like to have you consider these five questions. Um, this can really set the tone for your unique classroom. And I'm going to give you some examples of each of these. So the first one is when you think of doing student presentations, who is your intended audience? You know, I know oftentimes it may seem like, well, if I have my students present, I want the rest of the class to listen in. And that is um, a very typical scenario, but there can be other options for your intended audience. For instance, you may have some type of a setup where it's like a, a shark tank scenario where students give a presentation and then they get feedback from a select panel, um, in which case it might be just a small group that they are presenting to. Additionally, I have seen instructors who have done things like ask their students to record a sample patient intake uh, process. And in this scenario, this happened, I know, during the pandemic, I think it was for physical therapy, the students asked their loved ones to play the part of the patient, and they had to do kind of a simulation of what it would look like for a brand new uh, patient. How would they be assessed? Um, how was the, the paperwork filled out, et cetera? And in which case, this was not really a, a presentation that was meant for anybody else's eyes other than the instructor. Um, so as you think about this, it can help you determine should these presentations be posted kind of in a public scenario, such as to a discussion board, or is this an assignment that goes directly to the instructor? The next question that I'd like you to think about is, do you expect and do you invite follow-up commentary? Sometimes these may just be informative or it may be a presentation where it's like a final portfolio, um, in which case you may not expect any other interaction other than um, a public viewing. So that's something to consider as well. Something you'll want to think about is, should this be an interactive presentation? So is this going to be something that's formal, that's rehearsed, um, and, and oftentimes actually that's what we would see even in face-to-face -face classroom. Everybody would wait until the end of the, the presentation and there might be a, a round of applause. Um, or should this be something that is conversational and that invites people to ask questions? So think about that as well. Along the same lines, think of your unique classroom setup. Is it a synchronous class or an asynchronous course? There are different options available for each. And we are going to take a look at those in just a moment. Uh, and then you also want to think about formal or field presentations. So if you're not sure what those are, formal presentations are usually something that are practiced. Um, it, it's very much scripted or at least outlined. There are very specific uh, bulleted speaking points versus field presentations might mean you've asked your students to, to go out into the world and to record some of their findings. Um, and so this is, again, a, a very different tone. So think about all of these questions as we are going through some of these tools, um, and it might help you determine which types of technology you would like to integrate when you help your students deliver their online presentations. All right. We're getting close to the technology tools. I know that's everybody's favorite piece, so I promise that's up next. There are some advantages to student presentations that I think oftentimes are not discussed, and so these are in no particular order here. Um, but it does have this ability to uh, produce active engagement, and I know that's something that a lot of instructors worry about or struggle with in an online course. How do I know if my student is really engaged with the material? Well, 
if they have to present, then odds are they need to know their topic, you know, inside out and upside down. Um, and then of course, this does encourage expertise. In this scenario, it's not just that your students have a working knowledge to get by, they actually have to know it well enough to teach it to somebody else. Um, so along with that, it helps them to hone their organization, right? Presumably they're going to practice. Presumably they're going to come up with some sort of an outline and a structure, and this is going to help them strategize as a student. And one of the other things that I, I think a lot of people overlook is the idea that public speaking is one of the most recognized to fears in adult populations. And so when we have these online presentations, we're providing an opportunity for students to kind of gradually grow their skills and, and to become more comfortable with speaking in front of others. So there is a lot of different options here that are available with online presentations um, that sometimes I think get overlooked. And again, I, I know we've talked about this just briefly, um, but think about synchronous versus asynchronous. And if you've always done class presentations the same, you may consider switching it up and trying something new. If you have a synchronous presentation, then you have some of this real-time engagement, right? Um, this is an opportunity for students to really interact with each other. It may be an ideal uh, situation if you have perhaps uh, arguments and debates or if you have uh, persuasive speeches. Um, this is an opportunity to see how students think on their feet. So um, consider that as being a, an ideal opportunity for a synchronous course session. Um, you can also have your student speakers clarify concepts. If anything is confusing, people can, can ask questions at that moment. And of course, there is this conversation dynamic where people can interact and share the microphone. Versus asynchronous, um, this is really a good time for students to think in a very concise manner. They, they need to come prepared with a structure. This is a great opportunity for them to maybe prepare professionally. Presumably, some of our students are going to have to pitch ideas um, and, and different uh, proposals in other contexts, and so that you can give them some of this experience in your course. Um, and you can also invite them to rehearse and, and open up the, um, the recording. Uh, I don't want to say platform, but I guess I will. Recording platform early for your students so that they can continue to prepare for the final product. All right. So I do have a question for you about technology tools. If you give me just one moment here, I'm going to put a poll up on the screen for you. Give me just one second to type in the, the questions. Okay, so hopefully you can see this on your screen. There is no right or wrong answer to this, um, but at NNU we do have a variety of platforms that you can utilize if you host synchronous sessions. So I'd just like to know, um, typically, if you host a synchronous online course session, where do you meet with your students? Is it Teams, Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom? Could be something other than that, or um, you may just be entirely asynchronous. It looks like most of you have responded, so uh, hopefully you can see the responses up there on the screen. See a couple of Zoom, and I see a couple of Collaborate. I know Collaborate is a great option because it's integrated right into your Blackboard course, um, so oftentimes it's very easy for students to access. 
So we'll take a look at some different tools. Um, I think at this point, many of us are familiar with some of the basic web conferencing tools, such as polls and breakout rooms and things of that nature. So I'm going to try to give you a couple of different options that you may not have considered. All right. We'll go ahead and hide that. Uh, and we'll take a look. I think I have six different technologies uh, that may give you a little uh, a different perspective from what you've been using. So maybe this will give you some fresh perspective on what students can do with their online presentations. The first one that we have is VoiceThread. Now, VoiceThread is actually integrated at NIU, so there are some different options here. Uh, but VoiceThread gives you this option where you can upload media, and this could be pictures or existing video content um, to a slide. You can also upload documents, which is really nice. Much like a PowerPoint, students can narrate it, um, but the addition here is that they can pause it, they can draw on the slides to, to point you to a certain direction, um, and then they can resume playing the, the slides as they continue to narrate the, their presentation. Um, we do offer instructions for students as well as instructions for teachers, so at the end of this workshop, I'll go ahead and I'll send you links to both. But the idea here is that you can use VoiceThread in your course um, a couple of different ways. So you have the ability as an instructor, you can integrate this um, just as an ungraded activity. It's a way for students to do some presentations, get that practice in, um, but it does not count for a grade. Or you can also have this integrated into your course as a graded activity, which will populate a grade column in the Blackboard gradebook. So that's another option that you can think about with your students. There's Flip, which formerly was known as Flipgrid, but um, has since changed names. Now, this is not an integration at NIU, but it is um, available where you can sign up for free. I saw earlier that somebody said they used this because they struggled with file sizes for students. Um, so this is a great option. If you sign up for free, you'll be prompted to start a group. And you have a couple of different options for how you uh, connect with your group. For instance, if you have a small course roster, you can just send emails directly to students to participate, or you can do what I prefer um, and just copy a shareable link. Anybody who has a copy of that link will be able to participate. So you could post it in your Blackboard course, you could send it out in, to individual emails. Um, so lots of possibilities there. But in response, students will record their own presentations. Um, so this is, gives you kind of this nice back and forth banter, even in an asynchronous format. Whoever starts this, so again, as we talk about student presentations, remember, you don't always have to be the organizer or the facilitator. You can actually ask students to set up their own free account. Um, but whoever is the primary organizer is going to select Time limit, which is really kind of interesting and it's a great way to encourage people to answer a question quickly and concisely. You can do anything from 15 seconds up to 10 minutes. So um, for a recording, that's actually quite an extensive amount of time. I know as a student, I remember I was in a composition and rhetoric course. And on the first day of class, the instructor said, okay, no books, no, no outside resources, don't pull up your cell phone define rhetoric. Um, and so this would have been an excellent activity where people would just turn on their webcam and record what they perceive to be the definition of rhetoric. Uh, so I think, again, as presentations, they don't have to be super long and super extensive. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities for integrations into your class. The third one that I have is Mentimeter. And if we have time, um, I can actually show you a little bit what this looks like. So Mentimeter is, again, a free uh, application. Now, again, it's not an integration with, at NIU, um, but you can create an account for free. And this is ideal for real-time presentations. So it allows you to create quizzes, polls, and word clouds. And if you're not familiar with a word cloud, this is an example of actually what you're seeing on the screen. 
Um, you would ask somebody a question. So in the sample up here, it's asked the question, how do you feel today? And um, the respondents were prompted, they could go to menti.com and they could use a specific numerical code. So they could type this in on their cell phone. Um, or if they wanted, they could um, just use a link that was provided, say like in a text chat, like in a Blackboard Collaborate session. Um, and they could respond. Anybody who um, comes up with a, a word that's uh, popular or people keep hearing it, there are quite a few people who appear to be happy, it become, that word becomes bigger and it takes the center of the screen. Um, so it's just a, a great way to kind of boost engagement in a live synchronous session. Um, Additionally, you can also ask students to submit questions anonymously through Mentimeter, which I think is, um, again, another nice way to relieve some of the pressure. One thing that we've learned with our online students is that sometimes students who are typically more reserved, they could be shy, they could be introverted, um, but students who are not quick to maybe raise their hand in a face-to-face -face setting are more willing to participate in an online setting. Um, and this can often have to do with anxiety. So um, again, if you open this up as a platform for a synchronous presentation um, and you invite questions, people can um, ask questions anonymously. Um, and so this might spark more classroom conversation than if they felt they were on the spot if you called on them by name. So. Um, lots of good ideas here for what you can do um, just with another free tool. All right, so we also have Microsoft Teams. Now, um, I didn't see anybody had used Microsoft Teams um, for any of their classroom synchronous sessions, but this is another option. So Microsoft Teams actually comes with a bunch of different apps that can be integrated. Some of them I think may come with a fee, but actually a large majority of them are free. So um, in order to use the Microsoft Teams apps, you would want to advise your students that they need to download the free desktop application first, and that is key. Um, so I took a screenshot actually of what this looks like on my end from uh, Microsoft Teams. I have downloaded the desktop application and on the left side of the menu bar there I clicked on apps and all of these free options appeared so you could use a polling feature by Microsoft there's another one called Polly um, but these allow you to ask people in live time to maybe vote on something to, you can take a poll um, additionally and I didn't highlight it right below it you'll see where it says forms Microsoft uh, Microsoft actually offers its own word cloud. So again, you could still use this in a Microsoft Teams meeting. And this is licensed by NIU, so you and your students can all use this. This is actually what um, a Microsoft Teams meeting looks like. So if you have not been in one of these, um, it, it's pretty similar to Zoom or Collaborate. Uh, but at the top of the screen, you could click the little three dots and you could go to add an app. And again, that is how you would add something like a word cloud. So all these interactive features that help the speaker connect with their audience. And this is um, actually exactly um, what it looks like. So this is the Microsoft Forms um, Word Cloud. So I just wanted to show you what this looks like. It is not a feature that is unique to Mentimeter or anything like that. Um, there are different options available out there, but you can use them for free in a variety of platforms. And so now we can actually take a look um, at the different platforms. I specifically wanted to talk about Zoom, and I saw that a couple of you use Zoom. Um, for those of you who are not aware, Zoom actually kind of underwent a transformation whiteboard. So pre-pandemic, they had a whiteboard tool, but the tool itself was um, pretty flat. There, there wasn't really anything too exciting about it. It looked and felt much like any whiteboard tool, like something that you would use in Blackboard Collaborate or Teams. 
and they updated it. And to give you a little bit of background on the whiteboard tool, I've discovered that it is only available to licensed Zoom users, which everybody at NIU is a licensed Zoom user. Uh, but it, it has some additional capabilities that I haven't seen with any other um, type of whiteboard. So this could be um, a great platform if you have a synchronous course session. The whiteboard has some abilities where you can sketch, you can create diagrams, you can upload pictures, you can even record videos, um, type in text, lots and lots of different features in there. You can also um, add in sticky notes. The Zoom whiteboard is available for the entire group. So if you start your class in Zoom, collectively everybody can use the whiteboard together. Or if you use breakout groups, the gr breakout groups can create their own individual whiteboards. Additionally, your students can then um, go ahead and save their whiteboard. So maybe you had four different breakout groups. That means that there were four different whiteboards uh, in creation. When you pull them back together as a full class, then you can ask the different groups to go ahead and pull up their saved whiteboards. So now I, everybody can see what the different groups were working on. You can also now return to your whiteboard after the meeting has ended. So after class is over, it is actually saved to the Zoom user profile. So you can continue to access it. Um, additionally, you can even share it with people who were not in attendance. So maybe you had your students in groups and somebody was not available. Um, you can actually invite them to look at the whiteboard um, later on, even if they weren't there when it was created. Now, I tell you all of this because um, I've played around with the Zoom whiteboard quite a bit, and I discovered it's kind of a, its best kept secret because a lot of people don't realize that you must be logged in as a licensed NIU Zoom user. Uh, so if you've ever created a Zoom session and maybe sent out a guest link and your students clicked on the guest link, well, if they were not logged into their own Zoom account, uh, they would not see this brand new whiteboard. In fact, they would only see the old one that's kind of lackluster. So how do you avoid that? So I've put the different steps up here above. Um, this is NIU's Zoom uh, address. If you can't remember it, because I never can, I honestly, I'll just open up a tab in my web browser. I'll go to Google and I'll look up NIU Zoom. And it's the very first option that appears. You are gonna to wanna to instruct your students to click sign in and they need to enter their login name correctly. So I have two example formats here for you. Uh, if you're an instructor, you have an AID. So it would be you know, your AID at mail.niu.edu versus students typically have a ZID, so it would be their ZID at students.niu.edu. Um, they will be prompted then to enter their password and the password is the exact same as whatever you're using to get into Blackboard. Um, but this is how you make sure that you are logged in as a Zoom licensed user and not just through a guest link. Uh, once you are logged in, then you can go ahead to um, the next screen where you could supply your students with the meeting ID. It's actually the, the numerical link to get into your session rather than the guest link. Um, and so again, this is up here on the screen just so you can take a look at it. Um, it does say that you know, Megan Holt A1891715 is a licensed user. Um, and so that's how you know that you are logged in and you can use all of the fun features that are provided with our license. Otherwise, they're hidden. So I feel like this is one of the best kept secrets about Zoom. All right. The um, last one that I have here is uh, Kaltura. You know, Kaltura is NIU's official video platform. Um, so somebody had mentioned earlier, and I forget who it was, I do apologize, but someone mentioned that they have um, trouble with their students who um, are trying to upload really large files, um, and then they don't load. 
Um, sometimes they use really unusual formats. They might have recorded with some sort of a platform that you're unfamiliar with. Um, so this can really create kind of a, a series of problems. So um, I do recommend Kaltura, and I am actually in the middle of creating a quick uh, just a couple minute long uh, demo video for students on how to record with Kaltura and then to upload to a Blackboard assignment. So if as an instructor you would like to just include that tutorial in your class, um, please send me an email and let me know. I will be happy to pass that along to you. So that is on my bucket list this week. But um, Kaltura is a really nice video platform and the fact that you have three different options here. You can record your audio, you can record your video, and you can record anything that's on your screen. So um, this is particularly helpful maybe if you want to share numerous documents or you want to toggle back and forth between maybe a PowerPoint slide and a website. Um, anything that appears on your screen, you can capture. Um, and of course, you have options. Like I said, it, it's up to you what you want featured in your recording. So um, when you start the recording, you'll get this kind of image um, that you see on the left here. And the icons that are blue means they're active. So in this case, it looks like somebody is recording their screen activity, um, as well as their voice, their audio narration. But because the camera is grayed out with a slash through it, we can tell they do not have their webcam on. Additionally, if you see the little arrow pointing to the bottom right corner here, um, there are some other features that I think people um, don't realize are even connected with Kaltura, but you can click on the little pencil icon and now you have a whole host of tools that you can use. So you can draw arrows and type text, you can change the color, you can change the width of the, the arrows um, to things that are important on your screen. So um, it does give students this ability to say, hey, check out this website, and I, I really want you to pay attention to this tab. Um, so it, it does give them some flexibility, maybe that is typically not um, what we see in a traditional PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to pause here for just a moment. Um, I know that was six different tools that we have um, available at our fingertips. Do I have any questions so far? You can go ahead, you can type in the chat or you can come on the microphone, whatever's easiest for you. Um, Megan, this is Marsha. I have a question. Sure. On the Zoom whiteboard. So if you're conducting the class on Collaborate and you go to breakout groups, can that breakout group, they can all sign into Zoom and do a whiteboard and then share that when they come back to collaborate or don't those two mix? Um, they typically don't mix, they're separate platforms. So honestly, I would tell you just to start your entire class probably in Zoom, just stay in, in one platform. Okay, and sometimes we have that login, is it SSO or SRO, you know what I'm talking about? And I just click um, on that. Single sign on. Yeah. So, um, you know what, let me, let me pause here for a moment. I can um, I can show you what this looks like. Instead of typing uh, your the ID and then that, I, I've always gone that. Let's take a look at it. All right. Um, I think you can see my screen. Sorry, that was kind of crazy looking. Um, this is what I would do for Zoom. I would just open up a tab that says Google. Um, I, I think you can see my screen. And yes. I would just do NIU Zoom. Now, I, it's always the first link that appears. So it's Zoom, NIU, Division of Information Technology. Um, you can click log in to Zoom. If somebody is in the same browser and they're already logged into Blackboard, they'll sign on automatically. That is related to the single sign-on. If they're not logged into Blackboard, when they go to on login, um, they can do sign in. Um, and then it'll ask them for the ID and the password. 
of course, I am logged into Blackboard. So, did that answer your question? Yeah, basically, start with Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's not that you can't use both um, platforms, but inevitably, I lose students along the way when I start jumping. So I, yeah. I try to find one and stick with it. Okay. So uh, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing. Are there any other questions? Okay. All right, I see something just came in on the text chat. So uh, let me pull up my slides here and answer that and then we're making good progress. And this was my other um, Kaltura slide for you very quickly. So if your students are wondering where to find Kaltura when they log into Blackboard, or if you've not used it and you would like to experiment with it, um, instead of going to courses on the left uh, navigation there, just go down to tools and click on Kaltura My Media. Um, but let me get to that text chat. I, I see things coming off from there. Okay, so one question that we have here, it's an asynchronous course and students uh, face should be visible through the presentation. What would be the best tool um, for a video recorded presentation? I would recommend using Kaltura because it has that option for the uh, webcam and there's something that's called a confidence monitor. So they'll see a little image of themselves down in the bottom right corner of their screen. So if they suddenly move or, you know, if they adjust their chair and they're off screen, they're going to see it and they can immediately correct it. Um, so I, I think that's definitely an advantage and that's what I would recommend. And I would try to use Kaltura since it's free and it's licensed and it's built into Blackboard for them. And Kaltura does work exceptionally well in Ultra as well as Original. Um, it's almost identical. And Marsha, if we have time at the end, I'll even give you a preview on how students can upload it. But again, I'm also working on a, a recording. So um, I'd be happy to share that with you so that you don't feel like you're personally responsible for showing your students the steps that are involved. So does Kaltura allow students to download their video MP4 file? Students need to upload uh, the MP4 file on Yellowdig. Yes, it certainly does. So um, when they go to their Kaltura media library, there's um, a tiny little square in the top right corner of their video that they can click on um, that allows for a download. And they can also upload existing videos into their uh, Kaltura account as well. So um, it works both ways. I'll give you a couple of strategies to go along with the technology, and then if we have time, I can give you um, some, some you know, kind of previews of what things look like. Um, if you want to see Kaltura, I can definitely demonstrate that for you as well. So um, as far as instructor strategies go when it comes to online presentations, I'm a big fan of trying to incorporate grading rubrics. Now, this is just a generic grading rubric. This is not um, fashioned in Blackboard, but it easily could be uh, transformed into a Blackboard um, interactive grading rubric. But I did like this one because it, it gave a lot of information for students. Um, in this particular presentation, it looks like students are being graded on content, organization and clarity, the completeness, grammar and mechanics, documentation, their delivery um, and their interactions with the audience. So there was a lot of different things that they were being graded and assessed on. And when you post this along with the assignment, um, students feel like they can like they can check items off the list. They can make sure that they have mastered all of these different um, items that, that you're looking for. And so this helps to kind of ease the transition into speaking online and people don't feel like they are shocked by the grade in which they received. So um, as often as possible, I try to be upfront with my students and to let them know this is what I want to see in your presentation. 
If I have anything to complain about this rubric, I would say that because we read left to right, I would tell you to reverse the order and put mastery um, at the beginning instead of um, the lower scoring objectives. Some of the things that we can do with our students with presentations um, really are not technology specific. And so if you ask your students to develop an online presentation, consider asking them to interact with their audience. Um, develop something that goes along with that, with that presentation. And so I, I threw some ideas up here for you in a post test. Give your students a quiz before the presentation, see what they know, and then ask them to score the post-test, see, see what they've learned in, in that short amount of time. Uh, maybe they need to complete a follow-up worksheet, flowchart, or um, journal reflection. Additionally, you can ask your students to get involved and go on a scavenger hunt. I've seen this work very effectively in a marketing course. Once the student delivered a presentation on a specific marketing strategy, the other students in the, task, in the class were tasked with going out um, and taking a screenshot of what they felt was an example of that particular marketing strategy. Um, it was a way to, to make sure that students had in Analyzed all of that information and they understood this technique. So think again, not just what can we do with video recording, but um, what can we do as, as you know presenters and audience members alike. I often look for milestone moments that I can help my students with for their presentation. Um, it can be a scary thing if you ask for students to deliver a presentation and, and you haven't had any of these kind of check-in moments. Um, so for instance, you might ask them about their topic, have a specific due date when they must have their, their topic approved. Um, is there a day when they need to come to class with an outline? Um, you could think about having them do a draft of their presentation, and I certainly don't mean to increase your workload, but again, this could just be an interactive class activity. It's not graded, but maybe they're working on um, peer revisions and, and looking at each other's drafts. Um, so this is another way for them to get feedback before they go into that final circle layer of the, the actual final presentation. We also kind of want to think about our students' sense of autonomy and how, how are they invested in their presentation topic. We know, typically speaking, that people tend to give their best performance when they are personally invested in the project at hand. So I've given you a couple of ideas here for how you can get students engaged in the topic selection process. Uh, one idea that I like, and it works really well, it's very easy to set up in Blackboard Ultra, is to do a self-enroll group. Um, you know, as an English instructor, I might have had three different groups, um, and all they would know is the topic. So maybe I had one that was devoted to um, Edgar Allan Poe. Maybe I had another group to Jane Austen, and then, you know, I had a third group devoted to Charles Dickens. Now, they might recognize the names of the authors, but they wouldn't actually know what their assignment was until they, they signed up for their group. So um, it gave them a little bit of selection, but ultimately I was still able to guide the the topic um, selection process. You can ask your students to write topic proposals. I often like to make sure that they write more than one proposal. If for some reason you need to reject um, one of their proposals, whether it's too vague, somebody already claimed it, or it's off topic, um, this gives them an opportunity to, to still choose something that's of interest to them. We can do a funnel approach, and that's where your students come to class. You give them a large uh, kind of umbrella topic, and they get to choose something um, underneath that, that large umbrella topic that you've provided. Um, they are going to do the work, and they're going to fine tune that question and come up with an individual topic for their presentation that's unique from anybody else in the class. The classroom swap is always kind of a fun idea. Um, if you are teaching more than one section of the same course, you can ask your students um, in each class to generate a list of topic uh, selections, and then you swap lists between the classes. Um, this is a, a great idea to let them know how, the, how their ideas can impact uh, 
other people, even outside of their own classroom. And of course, there is the adventure challenge. Um, I, I associate this one much like a personality quiz. Um, if, if you ask your students to choose a topic, oftentimes they're going to choose the one that they're most familiar with. Right? They, they think that this is going to optimize their chances of success and a really good grade. But as instructors, we also want to challenge our students to learn something new. You can present them with a series of questions and have them tally it. At the end, ask them, you know, which section did they get the most correct answers? And which section did they get the fewest correct answers? If they knew the least amount of information about, you know, question A, um, that's what their their chosen topic should be. Um, so um, again, it, it's letting them um, kind of self-assess their own knowledge and then prompting them to choose something that's less familiar. Um, all right, I know we're we're getting close on time, so I want to make sure I have enough time to answer questions or to do any type of demonstration. So um, I do also have some strategies that you can share with your students and. As we're getting closer and closer towards finals week, I thought we all needed a little injection of humor into our daily activities. So hopefully this will make you smile just a bit. They are good strategies, but the slides are intended to bring a little bit of levity to your day. The first idea here is to remind your students to have some environment awareness. The number one thing that I actually uh, received as a tip was when I was interviewing for a job and they said, be careful, uh, don't, don't turn your webcam on in front of your bookshelf because oddly people get distracted by the books behind you and they want to zoom in to see what you're reading. Um, so uh, similarly, if you're in front of a bulletin board, just be aware you know, that students in the class will be able to see your post-it notes and your daily reminders. So uh, think carefully about your background. This is something that oftentimes control. Uh, the other one here is a great example actually of, of what I look like if I turn on my webcam in my um, office on campus. So um, I have very poor lighting. I often look like I'm here to ask for ransom money. But again, if you can always ask your students uh, to prepare in advance and to consider putting a lamp somewhere behind their webcam or behind their laptop so that we can actually see their faces. All right, you can also remind them to do the technology check. So again, I, I hope this kind of makes you laugh if you, we all remember our Verizon commercials. Can you hear me now? Um, ask your students you know, to, to log in a couple minutes ahead of time. Um, make sure that they know how to operate their webcam. If they're using some type of a headset or an external microphone, make sure that the settings are detected by the computer. Um, additionally, if they're using a shared device, and many families do, uh, kids oftentimes like to save their filters on uh, Zoom. So I, I think we often heard about the uh, lawyer during the pandemic who logged in and was a talking cat. We kind of want to avoid some of those things. So um, a little bit of preparation and double checking before the live event is highly encouraged. And you can even ask students to set aside some time to do that. The other one is um, this idea that we, we don't need to write down every single idea that we have on our PowerPoint slides. And this is tough. Even as educators, I think we're going to struggle with this. So tell your students to practice ahead of time. They'll remember their key bullet points if they've rehearsed, if it becomes second nature. Um, if they're just trying to do this cold, they've never practiced giving a presentation, um, odds are they may feel at the end of the presentation like, oh, I forgot something or, oh, that wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and if they feel confident and if they feel like they know their, their topic inside and out and upside down, uh, they don't need all of those verbal cues listed on a PowerPoint slide. Your audience is already looking at your slide. They're reading it. So you don't have to put every single thing on there. Um, so it is, it's to try to encourage them to put more emphasis on knowing the material and being engaging as a presenter than it is about crafting this detailed PowerPoint slide. And so I hope you sincerely appreciate the slide.
The other one is a little bit um, less humorous, but I, it speaks to me as an English major. And it's this idea that no matter how encouraging we are as instructors and, and how we try to tailor our feedback to, to inspire students to keep going, um, nothing competes with that aha epiphany moment that they may have as a student themselves. So um, try to facilitate this environment where they have to practice and they have to revise. It is during those moments where students may realize, I didn't like that, or, oh, I think I could have done something different. Um, that will stick with them far more than, than any other words of encouragement um, when they realize, when they've self-evaluated their own work and, and they've determined that there are things that they did really well, but there were also opportunities where they could have improved. Um, this slide always makes me laugh. One of my previous supervisors actually um, does this for all of her, her uh, Zoom meetings or, or Teams meetings. She actually sticks the googly eyes right next to her webcam on her, on her laptop so that she remembers to make eye contact because it's just not natural to look at the webcam. Uh, we are trained to look at the screen. So um, try to talk to your students about how to make eye contact when they're using a web conferencing session. Um, it's a great way to get them away from reading off of a script. It is hard to read off of a script and to come across as this, you know, engaged conversationalist. So um, try to ease them away from that by focusing on, on using the webcam as their focal point. Um, it is a great low pressure environment to get people acclimated to public speaking. Um, if you know somebody has a fear of public speaking, you can ask everybody else in the audience to turn off their webcams. Um, so this is a kind of a slow acclimated process. And it does help instill confidence. So when they need to speak in front of groups of people again, it, it is a gradual progression. Um, and so we have this ability in an online format to, to slowly build up to face-to-face -face interactions. All right, so with all of that, uh, we've got about five minutes left. I do want to let you know that we have a brand new workshop coming out. Um, I know we're getting close to finals, so the great news is this is a new type of workshop. It's only 30 minutes long, um, but I'm excited about this one. We've never delivered it. If you want to learn about field recordings, um, so instead of just sitting in front of, say, maybe a webcam, but to take videos on the go or you want your students to take videos on the go, then we have a 30-minute workshop on uh, Thursday, December 1st that's dedicated to how to use the Kaltura mobile app. I feel like this is a piece of technology that is uh, frequently overlooked and most people don't know it exists, so um, it may help you reimagine what these presentations look like. All right. So thank you, everyone. I, I know we made it just in the nick of time. I am available for questions, or if you would like me to demonstrate anything, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I can give you back four minutes of your day, and I'm going to turn off the recording now. <laughs>